6, and um, we're continuing our study of the doctrine of salvation as we spend our summer months on the doctrine of eternal security. Um, Here's a definition we've been going by. Eternal security means those who have been genuinely saved by God's grace through faith alone and Christ alone (coughs) shall never be in danger of God's condemnation or a loss of salvation, but God's grace and power keep them forever saved and secure. So uh, what you'll discover as you go into, as you kind of tour the body of Christ is not a lot of people, well, a lot, but maybe half the body of Christ accepts eternal security and half does not. Um, is this microphone working good? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay, good. So we're trying to figure out, is this really true? Uh, once saved, always saved? Or <coughs> are we on some kind of divine probation? God's going to rip the carpet out from under us at some point. Is that even a possibility? So, we in our first class together, we kind of laid out some introductory thoughts about the doctrine of eternal security. And what we're doing now is we're going through the eternal security arguments. I've got, I think, about 13 of them. Um... When you put all of them together, I think you have a very strong case of eternal security. But in the second part of the class, not today, but down the road, I'm going to show you the verses that at first glance seem to contradict eternal security. There's about 47 passages at least, but we're not dealing with that today. So here is some of the here are, here are the arguments, um, thirteen of them. We've gone through the first four. You might remember them as follows: because self righteousness did not save us in the first place, it is not a basis upon which salvation can be lost. And then we also saw that salvation is not given or maintained by good works. So those first two points are basically trying to say we got into the the relationship with God by His grace. So if we got into a relationship with God by His grace, why would He turn around and say, okay, you better maintain your salvation by good works? (coughs) Because people that think you can lose your salvation are always saying you have to stay away from sins X, Y, and Z, whatever those are. They never define them. But if you don't stay away from them, then you can lose your salvation. So basically what they're saying is you're saved by God's grace, but you better keep your salvation by works. Which, those first two points are just trying to say that would be an inconsistency. And then one of the points we looked at, number three, is if a believer can lose his eternal life, then how can eternal life be what? Eternal. That doesn't make any sense, does it? So we went through these passages here which indicate that if you receive the gift of life, the Bible keeps saying it's eternal. In fact, it's the Greek word ionios, which means forever. It's actually the same word used to describe God. So if eternal life can be lost, it really was never eternal to begin with, right? John 3.16, you all know by heart probably, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's the Greek word ionios. And then we went through this argument, number four. Um, the, Bible's, the Bible's promises guarantee eternal security. So I took you through the strongest verses I know of in the Bible. John 4.14, John 5.24, John 6, John 10, Romans 8, Hebrews 13. And if we take these at first face value, and can God lie? No, He can't. If we take these at face value, 
particularly the John 10 verse verses. If you take these at face value, it's very clear that once you're in the hand of God, absolutely nothing can take you out. And then last week I wasn't here, but Jim McGowan taught, I think, birth truths. And that's sort of the uh, idea. We'll, we'll talk more about these as we get into the class, but how can you undo birth truths? I mean, if you're born, can you be unborn? I mean, do you know anybody that's physically born into the world that can suddenly get unborn? You can't undo a birth, can you? So doesn't the Scripture talk about our relationship to God as a new birth? So if you can't undo birth at the physical realm, how could you undo birth at the spiritual realm? So hopefully Jim uh, covered some concepts like that last time. And we're now on to our fifth argument of the reality of eternal security. And that fifth argument is this. If eternal security is not a reality then the assurance of salvation is impossible. Now there's a lot of places, a lot of, a lot of churches, they'll teach you eternal security, but they'll say you can't really know if you have, have salvation or not. So, um, they'll basically say, if you're one of the elect, you have eternal security, but you really don't know if you're one of the elect. Because the proof of being one of the elect is are you going to persevere to the end of your life? So they're teaching eternal security, but at the same time they're denying what we would call the assurance of salvation, which is the idea that the Christian can know that they have eternal security. So we, we don't just teach eternal security here. We also teach the assurance of salvation. We teach the idea that once saved, always saved. And beyond that, we teach the idea that you can actually know that you have this salvation. It's not a guessing game. So, let me take you through some passages that I believe teach the assurance of salvation. And um, the key point is, if the Bible was, was denying eternal security, there's no way we could ever know we're going to heaven. But the Bible over and over again wants the child of God to understand that they're on their way to heaven if they have trusted in Christ. So, uh, oldest book of the Bible, Job 19, verses 25 and 26. Uh, notice, notice what it says. And Job had a lot of problems, didn't he? So he might have thought, gosh, in the midst of all of his problems, I guess I'm, not, I'm, I guess I'm not going to heaven. But notice what he says there in Job 19, verses 25 and 26. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will take his stand on the earth. So that's, a, that's the doctrine of the second coming in the oldest book of the Bible. And then he says, even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I will see God. So Job says, even if you destroy this body, it's going to be resurrected one day, and I'm going to see God. Now he said that in the midst of all of his affirmities and difficulties. So this is very clearly a man that had the assurance of salvation. There doesn't seem to be any real question marks in his mind about it. Uh, take a look at one book to the right, Psalm 23. And who wrote Psalm 23? David. Did David have problems? Yeah. I mean, he committed murder, committed adultery. And what does he say in Psalm 23, verse 6? I believe it is. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord for how long? Forever. So there's both Job and David. They seem to have settled in their hearts this assurance of salvation. I'll be in the house of the Lord forever. Now, you go into the New Testament, John 5.24. And you have a very strong passage on the assurance of salvation. I use this passage a lot because it's probably one of the strongest. 
and this is God's promise to you. Truly, truly, which is the word amen, which means it is certain, says it twice. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word, and then it gives the single condition necessary to become a Christian, which is to believe in Christ, which we've defined earlier in the course as trusting in him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has, that's present tense, eternal life. And does not come into judgment, but has crossed or has passed. Now, passed is in the perfect tense, which indicates a one-time action in the past with ongoing results. So it's not like we're passing out of death unto life. We've already passed out of death unto life the moment we've trusted in Christ. So truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has, present tense, eternal life, and does not come into condemnation, but has, you could translate it this way, has already crossed out of death unto life. So you read that and you you don't see any real ambiguity of your eternal destiny. If, if you've placed your faith in Christ. Now, the problem with us is we evaluate our lives by our works so frequently instead of living our lives on the promises of God. And so you, you can either spend your life upset because of your shortcomings, which we all have, or you can trust God's promises. And I would suggest that when you read John 5.24, it promises not just eternal security, but it promises the believer that they can know they're going to heaven. Uh, notice just one chapter to the right, John 6.47. Another very strong assurance of salvation passage. John 6.47. Jesus again is speaking, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me has, present tense, eternal life. So trusting in Christ, there's a promise from God that you are given the gift of life. And notice the word eternal again. It's life which can never be taken away. Um, Paul in the book of Acts, take a look at Acts 16, verses 30 and 31. This is how Paul uh, shared the gospel. What does Paul say there? Acts 16, 30, and 31. This is the Philippian jailer. Remember the story in Philippi where there's an earthquake, the jail is open, all the prisoners escape except for Paul and Silas. And they stay in the prison. And the, the jailer is about ready to commit suicide. Why is he ready to commit suicide? Because you're as good as dead if prisoners escaped on your watch. And he sees something supernatural in Paul and Silas. Because first of all, before the earthquake happened, they had been flogged. And what were they doing all night long? You remember? Praising the Lord. That's kind of unusual, isn't it? Must be something special about these guys. And then when they have a chance to escape, they don't take it. So what does the jailer say? It says, and he, and after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's life's most important question, right? And what does Paul say? They said, be really sorry for your sins and fill out this card. No, didn't do that. They said, believe, that's a single condition. For salvation, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Then it goes on, it says you and your household. And sort of the implication is that they would go back into their households, at least the Philippian jailer would, and would share the faith with uh, his immediate family and they could be saved too. So it's not really teaching household salvation. You know, if I'm saved, my house gets saved automatically. It's it's. You know, God doesn't have any grandkids, right? Everybody has to have their own faith in Christ. But 
it's interesting to me the way, first of all, Paul, how he shares the gospel, how uncomplicated it is. He offers a single condition necessary to be saved. And then he says, once you believe in Christ, you will be saved. He doesn't say, you know, maybe you're saved, maybe you're not. We'll just have to wait till you get the end of your life to make sure you've got enough good works to prove you're saved. I mean, all that, all that teaching about waiting to the end of your life to see whether you're saved, you don't find that at all in the Bible. Paul just makes a simple statement that you're saved, and he gives this Philippian jailer the impression that he could know he's saved. Now, you go over into Paul in the book of Romans, and it's filled with this whole concept of the assurance of salvation. Uh, no, let me give you some, a few verses out of the Pauline letters. Notice, if you will, Romans 5 and verse 2. Through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith uh, into this grace in which we stand and we exalt in the hope of the glory of God. Now the key word to underline there, if you're an underliner in your Bible, is the word hope. Now, when we use the word hope, it's very different than how biblical writers use the word hope. Like we say, I hope uh, I get that job promotion. I hope my house sells. I hope the economy picks up. Um, I hope this works out in my life. I hope that works out in my life. And we kind of use this word as kind of an uncertainty. Maybe it's going to happen. Maybe it's not going to happen. We use the word hope as, as sort of uh, cautiously optimistic. But that is not how the Greek New Testament uses the word hope. The word hope in the Greek New Testament is elpis, which is not how we use the word hope in English. The Greek uses the word hope this way. It's not an anxious wishing or uncertainty but rather it's confident assurance of something yet future. So this is not an I hope so mentality, but rather it's an I know so mentality. So many times when we look at the word hope in the Bible, we substitute our own English word into it, but that's not how the Greek uses the word. So when Paul talks about the hope of glory, he's not saying maybe I'm going to get it, maybe I'm not. He's talking about something that is a confident assurance of something yet future. So what the Bible gives us is, if we understand it correctly, is this confident assurance. Um, Let me give you some more passages that reveal this word hope. And as I go through these, just notice how the word hope keeps showing up over and over again. Romans 8, notice verses 23 and 24. Just a few chapters to the right. And not only this, but we also, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our salvation as sons, the redemption of the body, all speaking of future glory with God. And then notice verse 24, for in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? So it's true that it all hasn't been revealed to us at the present time, but we can have, because it keeps using this word hope, confident assurance that we're going to get it. Notice uh, the book of Colossians for just a minute. Colossians 1.27. Just go to Romans, then 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, then you'll run into Galatians, and just remember, go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Or if you don't like that, an acronym, God's Electric Power Company. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. That way, 
when the pastor says turn to this or that, you're the first person to find it and everybody thinks you're the most spiritual person <coughs> in the room. Notice uh, Colossians 1.27, it says, To whom God willed to make known, that is the riches of the glory of His mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now glory is the final phase of our salvation, right? And notice how it's always prefaced, not always, but most of the time with this word hope, which is a confident assurance. I mean, see, if you're, if you're living your life not really sure if you're going to heaven or not, then you're living beneath your privileges. Um, notice Titus 2.13. I don't know if I have any tricky mnemonic to find Titus, but you just hit the, just keep going to the right, you'll hit the T's. First Timothy, First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, Timothy, First Timothy, Second Timothy. Then you'll run into Titus, and then you'll go to Titus two thirteen, which is a passage we use to define the rapture quite a bit. It says, "Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus." So, what are you looking for today? The world system to, to clean up its problems. Uh, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the return of Jesus. And it, notice how it defines the return of Christ as the blessed hope. Jesus is coming back, whether I acknowledge it or not. He's coming to rescue us out of the world. And we can rest in that with confident assurance. Backing up, take a look at 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8. Just a couple of books after Romans. And tell me, as you read this, was Paul confident in his salvation? Uh, what does he say? You, you, you probably know this verse by heart. It says, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, We are of good courage. I say to you, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. So Paul says, if I die, I die. But if I die, I'll go directly into the presence of the Lord. I mean, it really doesn't sound like a, a guy here that had a lot of nagging doubts about whether he was saved. Uh, another passage on that note, notice Philippians 1, 20 through 23. Uh, Paul says, according to the earnest expectation and hope, there's our magic word, that I will not be put in shame in anything, but that, uh, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted uh, in my body, whether by life or by death. And here's verse 21. For me to live is Christ, to die is what? Gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. For I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is much better. So Paul says, you know, I, I, if I really had my choice in the matter, I'd just rather die and go to be with the Lord, which is far better. But for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If God wants me to continue on in the body, so be it. I'll continue to be a faithful apostle. I'll continue to write books of the Bible. I'll continue to minister to the church. Um, so he just says if it's a win-win. If I die, I go to a better place. If I don't die, God can keep using me in fruitful labor. So, you know, you read passages like this, you, know, you don't get this idea that the man on his deathbed had, had any real uncertainty as to his eternal destiny. He, he not only, but what I'm trying to get at is he not only believed in eternal security, that's one thing, but he believed in the assurance of salvation that it was a current possession of his. Uh, Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For our citizenship is where? In heaven for which we also eagerly await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will, now he starts talking about his resurrection, and look at how certain he is of his resurrection. 
who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the, of the, of the power that He has given to subject all things to Himself. So he very clearly says, I'm a citizen of heaven. No ambiguity there. And then he describes the resurrection of his body in very certain terms. And if I read that right, he actually uses the word glory. And I thought I saw the word hope in there. I want to double check that. (laughs) Related to his resurrection. Uh, Well, what if you're in a carnal state? Then what? Philippians 4.3 Indeed, true companion... I ask you also to help these women. Now, it's not just women who get in the carnal state, by the way. But here, it's talking about two women. I ask that you help these women who have shared in my struggle and the cause of the Gospel together with Clement and also the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written where? In the book of life. Now, if you go back to verse 2, he says, I urge you, Odia and Syntyche, to live in harmony in the Lord. So, what happened here? We have two women that once were allies of Paul, they once stood with Paul in the cause of the gospel, and they went back into the sin nature, which we have, as Christians have an ability to do, don't we? I don't have to go back to the sin nature, but it's always there for me to go back to. Today I sin not because I have to, I sin because I want to. I don't have to sin anymore because of my position in Christ. But many times I want to sin, and so I retreat back to the sin nature. And this is what happened to these two women, and they went from adversaries, excuse me, advocates with Paul, to being adversaries of each other because of probably some petty reason it's not given. But these two women were tearing the church apart. Syntyche and Euodia. I call, her, I call them Syntyche and Odious. So this is like a real life pastoral situation. And what's interesting to me about this is when Paul exhorts these women to start behaving properly, he never calls into question their salvation. In fact, he specifically says in verse 3, at the end of it, that their names are in the book of life. He doesn't say, uh, uh-oh, maybe those two aren't one of the elect. Look at how they're acting. So these are all very strong passages on the assurance of salvation. Uh, notice uh, Colossians 3 and verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you will be be revealed with Him in glory. So he he describes future glory as if it's obviously going to happen for the believer. No ambiguity whatsoever. And then one more on Paul's uh, letters. Notice 2 Timothy. Hopefully by now you guys know something about 2 Timothy. We've been studying it for about 30 plus weeks. 2 Timothy 1.12. I'm learning a lot about 2 Timothy 2, by the way. He says there, For this reason I uh, suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. Look at this. For I know in whom I have believed and am convinced. See how strong that language is? That he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Well, what had Paul entrusted to God? His soul. His eternity. And so he says, I'm going through a lot of problems in my life. In fact, as we know that when he wrote this, he was in jail, in prison. Difficult time. But he expresses complete confidence in the assurance of his salvation because it didn't, rest on Paul's ability to guard his own soul. You see that? I mean, if it, if it rests on our shoulders, then I guess there's, there's room to be nervous. Because I can mess things up, right? So can you. But he trusted completely in the ability of God to guard his soul. 
So does God ever mess botched jobs up? No, He doesn't. So Paul had the assurance of his salvation because he put the onus on God's promises, not his own shoulders. Then we go into the, uh, what we call the general letters. Um, there's about eight of them. And let me just give you a few verses out of the general letters. Notice uh, 1 Peter. So you want to get to the right of Paul's letters. And uh, you'll come to Hebrews and James and then 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Look at what Peter writes. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living what? Hope, confident assurance. <clears throat> through resurrection, that's future, but in this case it's resurrection of Christ, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, for you are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation to be revealed in the last time. Now notice that we are entitled to an inheritance. An inheritance legally is something that's yours. You just haven't entered into enjoyment of it yet. And you know you're going to get that inheritance because God says right here in His Word that it can't be defiled or corrupted. And then it goes on and it says we are currently being protected by the power of God. We don't protect ourselves. We're in God's power so that we will arrive in heaven on schedule to receive that inheritance. And you look at that, and that's a very strong assurance of salvation passage. Uh, one book backwards, two books backwards. Go back to Hebrews 2, verses 14 and 15. Now this is talking about death. And probably the greatest fear that human beings have always had is death. What happens when I die? Because, you know, we really can't see without the eyes of faith and God's Word what happens on the other side of the grave. So death has always been a terrifying prospect to humanity. And notice what the writer of Hebrews says. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Now watch this. And might, verse 15, and might free those who through the fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. So it's acknowledging that death is a dominant fear of human beings and it's saying that Jesus has come into the world to free us from the fear of death. And it even says if we're living with the fear of death, we're in a state of bondage. So if you as a Christian, if we as Christians are afraid of death, we're living beneath our privileges. Jesus specifically came into the world to liberate us from the slavery or the bondage of the fear of death. So that's a tremendous promise. A few more. Notice 1 John, further to the right there almost near the book of Revelation. First uh, John 3, verses 1 and 2. See how great the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God, and as such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not appeared as yet what we will be like. We know, see the certainty there? We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. So it's just a very clear promise that John makes to his readers that we're going to enter glory. There's no ambiguity about it at all. And when you enter glory, you're going to be just like Christ in terms of your character. And then uh, one more. This is probably 
probably in the whole Bible, other than John 5, 47, 1 John 5, 13 is very clear uh, on this subject of the assurance of salvation. Notice what he says. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Now notice this word written. When something goes into writing, it's objectively true. And then notice that this is a promise to all believers because he says, I have written to you, plural. So this is not a promise just for the elite, if there is such a thing as the elite in the body of Christ. This is not just a promise for elders and deacons, Sunday school teachers. It's to you, meaning all of God's people. And then you'll notice this word, no. No is not, maybe it's going to happen, maybe it's not. Maybe it's going to rain today, maybe it's not. It's an absolute assurance. And then believe. Believe is the single condition necessary to get saved, as we have said over and over again. And once you believe, and what's written to you and to all of us is something you can know, and what is it that you can know is that you can ha- that you presently have eternal life. So you don't live your life based on how you feel, based on what people say about you, based on your own standards. You live your life based on what God says. God who cannot lie has made you an ironclad promise that if you have trusted in His Son, you presently possess the gift of life. And because it's eternal, it can never be forfeited. So we're not talking about a maybe so. We're talking about a no so idea. So uh, eternal security is a wonderful thing. But even more wonderful than eternal security is the assurance of salvation, where you can a- it's actually part of your possession as a child of God that you know that you have it. A lot of people I talk to believe in eternal security, they just don't know whether they have it or not. And that's not what we're teaching here. We're teaching both eternal security and the assurance of salvation. Now, I found some quotes that are both good and bad. Let me give you some good quotes first that back this up. This is from Hannah Whittall. Smith, written in 1893, and she writes, In the first chapter of Numbers, we are told that only those Israelites who could declare their pedigree might be numbered among the men of war. And in the second chapter of Ezra, no one who could not find out his register and reckon his genealogy was allowed to exercise the office of priest. Any doubts or uncertainties on these points made them as polluted and consequently unfit to serve. She gives several verses there from both Numbers and Ezra. And then she says this, I believe the same thing is also true of Christians now. We can neither be numbered among the Lord's soldiers nor enter into priestly relations with Him until we can also declare our pedigree as children of God and reckon our genealogy as being born of Him. And what she is saying is people that knew where they came from genealogically who could confidently declare that were qualified to serve God in a a special way. And she's basically drawing the parallel because we're all priests. Revelation 1.6 says that we are all a kingdom of priests. And for us to really allow God to use us the way He wants to, we need to be able to boldly declare who we are as His children. So the more you buy into this doctrine of the the assurance of salvation, the more your mind is not divided on the subject, the more you can focus on what God has you to do, And you're not double-minded, as the book of James says. And the more God can use you in a strategic way. As long as you're bobbing back and forth, am I saved, am I not? She loves me, she loves me not, sort of mindset. The more you, in in a certain sense, disqualify yourself, not from heaven, 
but for being used by God strategically. That's her point. And I think it's a great point that she makes. And you say, well, these are really strange doctrines you're teaching. I've never heard anything like this before. What I want to communicate to you is that what I am saying used to be normal teaching. This used to be mainstream. And it doesn't, it's not hard to, to, look, to figure that out when you look at Dallas Seminary's doctrinal statement, Article 11. Dallas Seminary was started in the 1920s. And those that started the school started it very clearly with the belief in the assurance of salvation. And the statement says this, We believe it is the privilege not of some, but of all. So every child of God has this privilege. It, we believe it is the privilege not of some, but of all by the Spirit, through faith, who are born again in Christ as revealed in the Scriptures to be assured of their salvation. See, it's not, the statement is not just making a point about eternal security. It's making a point of the assurance of salvation. And be assured of their salvation when? Well, you've got to wait till the end of your life to see if you've done enough good works to prove you're one of the elect. No, it doesn't say that, does it? To be assured of their salvation when? The very day they take Him to be their Savior. Now, how in the world could you be confident in the assurance of your salvation? Because it goes on and it says, this assurance is not founded upon any discovery of their own worthiness or fitness. See, if I the only thing I had to work on was my own performance, I would not think I'm saved a lot of the time. I had a good day yesterday. I, I guess I'm saved that day. The prior day, I didn't have such a good day. I guess I'm not saved. And you see, that's the problem is people are looking introspectively at themselves all of the time. And they're not looking at the promises of God so this assurance of salvation is not based on any worthiness or fitness of their own, but wholly upon the testimony of His what? Word. Remember John says these things are written. This is objectively true, and God cannot lie. That's how the statement can come out and boldly declare uh, what we would call the assurance of salvation. <clears throat> but a lot of people, they're living this way. I've got faith, but I need to see works to prove I'm saved. And if that's your mindset, how do you ever know if you've done enough good works? I mean, what's the limit? How many old ladies do I have to help across the street? Three, five, seven, twenty? How many sermons do I have to preach? Um, it's, and that's what bothers me is people focus on themselves, these works they're supposed to do to prove they're saved are never objectively quantified. So you spend your whole life wondering if you've done enough, see, to prove that you're saved. And the Puritans, and this, this can be documented historically, the people that founded America, you know, who wanted to make America uh, a city on a shining hill, who founded the Ivy League schools, you know, God used those people in a strategic way, but you start getting into their writings, and a lot of them did not know they were Christians or not. A lot of them were pleading for God on their deathbeds for mercy. Now, you, you read through the Bible, I mean, is that what Paul's doing as he's getting ready to die? Is he pleading for God's mercy on his deathbed? No, he says, I am confident in whom I have believed. And the... Reform movement, you know, I read the Dallas Seminary Doctrinal Statement. The Reform movement, their, it's almost their Bible, is the Westminster Confession of Faith. I believe this was done in 1647. And when you get into Reform circles, heavy Calvinistic circles, you do not tamper with the Westminster Confession. That is the equivalent of tampering with the Bible. And what I want you to see is article seven, uh, chapter 17, article 3. Compare what they say about the assurance of salvation. Now, some of this is in Old English. It says, The infallible assurance doth not so belong to the essence of faith. So they are denying the assurance of salvation. They are not denying eternal security. 
what they are denying is the idea that you can know you have eternal security. And it goes on, it says, but that a true believer will wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he can become a partaker of it. And what it's saying is you really can't know if you're going to heaven or not because if you're one of the elect, you have to bear fruit. And you really can't know that until most of your life has transpired. That's why a lot, a lot of the Puritans on their deathbeds were given this very uh, nebulous standard and they were pleading to, for God's mercy. And, it, and it's sad when you think about it because they were hoodwinked into living beneath what God had promised them. Uh, here's Theodore Beza. He is one of the key guys in the Protestant Reformation. And I, you know, I criticize these Protestant reformers very carefully because a lot of them were killed for what they did in terms of breaking away from Roman Catholicism. But what you have to understand about Luther and Calvin and these luminaries in the Reform movement is they were Catholics. They came out of Roman Catholicism. And to assert that they just made a clean break is just naive. They came out of it and they reformed the church in certain areas, but they kept a lot of Roman Catholicism in place. That's why a lot of churches today, are they, they call themselves Protestant and Reformed, and they are, but they're quasi-Catholic in some of their beliefs. Many of them are still, bless their hearts, amillennialists, where they don't believe there's going to be a future earthly kingdom. Now, why wouldn't they believe that? Well, they rejected what Rome taught in certain areas, but they kept intact Roman Catholic eschatology. And so a lot of these guys broke away and they kept intact the, the parts of the Roman Catholic works-based system. So Theodore Beza says, Therefore I am elect, if first perceived from sanctification begun in me, that is by my hating of sin and longing, loving righteousness. So how, how, did, how did Theodore Beza handle assurance of salvation? He's not flying his plane here on the, based on, on the compass of the objective truths of God's Word. He's looking at himself. And he's saying to himself, you know, I'm hating sin and I'm loving righteousness, so I must be one of the elect, so I'm okay. Well, what happens if one week you fall in love with sin? Or you go back into sin? then the assurance of salvation disappears. And that's, this is not what the Scripture teaches, as I've tried to, uh, tried to argue. I like to use this quote by John Piper, because it's so outrageous. It's, it's astounding to me that the body of Christ can even tolerate this. It's so works-oriented. I'm not saying John Piper doesn't have some good things to say, but the man is steeped in Reformed theology. And he's steeped in Calvinism, a brand of it that says that the faith is a gift, and if you're truly one of the elect, you must bear fruit. And if that's your belief, then the assurance of salvation disappears. So he writes, no Christian can be sure he is a true believer. I mean, does that at all harmonize with the verses we went through earlier? No Christian can be sure he is a true believer. Hence, there is an ongoing need to be dedicated to the Lord, to deny ourselves the Lord, so that we might make it. And I look at a statement like that, and I said, that's work salvation right there. Why, why is that not denounced by, by a Christ, Christianity? But that statement passes as normal in, uh, in many circles. Um, John MacArthur uh, as I've said a number of times, I like a lot of the things John MacArthur teaches. Um, I've read several of his books. But on this doctrine of assurance of salvation, if you, if you get under the ministry of John MacArthur and you start listening to it regularly, you start reading his stuff, and there are people around that I call MacArthurites, uh, it's almost like you're challenging the Apostle Paul if you challenge John MacArthur in anything. You get around those people and what you'll discover is a lot of them don't have assurance of salvation. Because this comes through John MacArthur's ministry constantly. 
He writes in his book, Saved Without a Doubt, which to me is the most mislabeled book ever. If a Christian fails to love and obey the Lord through the trials of life, then there's no evidence that he possesses saving faith. Wow. So if I go through trials of life and I have any doubts, I'm not a Christian. Does not the book of James tell us that we as brethren can be like wind tossed to and fro? A wave tossed to and fro by wind? Of course a Christian can doubt things. Did not Peter doubt things? Did he not deny the Lord three times? Did he not walk out on the water to the Lord and saw the wind and the waves and begin to sink? I mean, are we going to say that Peter's salvation was suddenly erased at that point? He writes, if a person fails to love and obey the Lord through the trials of life, there is no evidence that he possesses saving faith. How many people do you know who came to church for a while, who had a little trouble in their lives and left? I've, I've left church for, for times in my life just because church is a place where you can get hurt by people. Uh, am I going to say I wasn't saved because I was you know, co- recovering from my wounds? Although they have made a profession of faith, they cannot be identified as those who love Him because their lives are not characterized by enduring obedience. Well, what is enduring obedience? I mean, how much obedience is necessary? It's never objectively quantified. So you wonder, do I have enough? And that's the state people are in. He goes on in his book, The Gospel According to Jesus, and he says, genuine assurance comes from seeing the Holy Spirit's transforming life work in one's life. So he's looking not at the promises of God, but is God using him? And that's where his assurance comes from. John Murray says the crucial test of faith reformed the crucial test of faith is endurance till the end abiding in Christ a continuance in the word he cannot abandon himself to sin he cannot come under condemnation of sin he cannot be guilty of certain kinds of unfaithfulness Let us appreciate the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints and recognize that we may entertain the faith of our security in Christ only as we persevere in the faith and holiness to the end. Another example of a denial, not of eternal security, but of the uh, assurance of salvation. And this... uh, if, you're, if you come out of a Roman Catholic background, this is largely what you think. Because you're told in Roman Catholicism... Yes, Dan? What's this mean? Yeah, well, I'm, I, I, I'm going to try to finish these, so I'll do my best. Um, if you come out of a Roman Catholic background, what you're basically told is you have to believe in Jesus. He does about 90% but you've got to do 10%. And what's your 10%? You've got to pay, pray, and obey. So how do you know if you've prayed enough, paid enough, or obeyed enough? And this comes out of the uh, New York Times. And it's summarizing Roman Catholic teaching. It says, Church teaching is that I don't know at any given moment what my eternal future will be. I hope, pray, and do my very best, but I still don't know. Pope John II doesn't absolutely know he will go to heaven, nor does Mother Teresa of Calcutta, unless either had a special divine revelation. Is that not a denial of the assurance of salvation? Oh, and then my buddy Arthur Pink. I love Arthur Pink. He wrote some great stuff. And then he says this, Readers, if there is reserve in your obedience, you're on your way to hell. Boy, that really gives me a lot of assurance of salvation. Arthur, you didn't say that, did you? And he did. Now, real quickly, what do you do with subjective experiences? Um, what do you do with 
a baby who has a birth certificate. That's how we know the baby is alive. But aren't there subjective experiences that go along with birth? Crying, growing, hunger, and those kind of things. So as a Christian, you know that you're a child of God based on the authority of God's Word. But aren't there subjective experiences we we have? Hunger for His Word. Hunger for fellowship with God's people. A love of righteousness. A hatred for sin. What Lewis Berry Chafer calls those is secondary experiences. So he says there is a normal Christian experience. There are new and blessed emotions and desires. Now I remember when I got saved, I had a desire to read the Bible. Never had that before. So that was sort of an evidence that I was truly a Christian. So there are these secondary experiences that we have. He says there is a normal Christian experience. They are new and blessed emotions and desires. Old things do pass away. And behold, all things do become new, but all such experiences are secondary evidences. See that? As to the fact of salvation and that they grow out of that positive repose of faith, which is the primary evidence. What is your primary evidence that you're saved? The promises of God that we went through earlier. What about other things that we have? A desire to pray, a desire to be with God's people. Chafer very carefully categorizes those as secondary evidences. And the reason they're secondary is if you move into carnality, those things can disappear. Just like in the physical world, you can have birth defects, can't you? You can have a physical birth, but there are complications that can happen in the life of a newborn child that hamper the growing process. So in the same way, we as Christians, and this is why Paul condemns carnality, can move back into carnality. And if you move back into carnality, what happens to those secondary evidences? They can be squelched, can't they? So Paul writes, And I, brethren, cannot speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not solid food. For until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal? Are you not behaving like mere men? So that's why Chafer is very clear to distinguish between primary evidences and secondary evidences. Primary evidence comes from the objective truth of God's Word that your salvation is sure. Certainly there are secondary evidences, but you need to count those as subsumed under the larger category of God's promises because those subjective experiences can be hampered through carnality. So the bottom line, Joseph Dillow has a good statement here, and this is where we're finished. It says, nowhere in the Bible is a Christian asked to examine either his faith or his life to find out if he is a Christian. He is told only to look outside himself to Christ alone for his assurance that he is a Christian. The Christian, however, is often told to examine his walk and his life to see if he's walking in fellowship and in conformity to God's plans. So I realize that this was sort of a hard-hitting study, and many of you may be struggling with this idea of assurance of salvation. I guess I would just leave you with just this parting uh, remark that the key thing in the assurance of salvation is to live your life not looking at yourself, but looking at what God's promised you to do. And secondary evidences which can come and go should not be your primary testimony. Um, that salvation is something that you can be assured of. As, as long as you keep placing the onus on God's promises and what God has purposed to do, then the assurance of salvation is yours. But once our eyes get off of God and His promises and onto ourselves, um, then it's very easy for us to start to miss
assurance of salvation and live beneath our privileges. So, sorry, I went a little long there. I wanted to get those quotes in because I thought they were important. So at this time, we will stop and we could open it up for some questions for a couple minutes, uh, if there are any. <laughs>